Good morning. It's great to be here, Pastor Dwayne. I'm jealous. I don't have violins <laughs> on our worship team. So if you violinists want to get on a plane with us, we can use you, I promise. Uh, let me begin by introducing my partner in life for the last almost 49 years. This is my wife, Paula. goes without saying she's the best part of what we do at Calvary Chapel of San Antonio. I also bring you greetings from um, what we believe to be the warmest, friendliest, most loving church in the world. Uh, they are right now in their in the second service, and um, I would appreciate if the thought comes to heart and mind over the time I'm teaching today. Uh, just, Lord, bless them in San Antonio. Uh, we want people to get saved. We pray daily for the lost, the hurting, the hungry, the broken, the needy, and the confused. And it seems that they've all gathered in Texas. So um, <laughs> just pray that the Lord will move there, and I'm praying that the Lord will move here. Could we open in a word of prayer, please? Father, we are delighted to be here. We've had a great couple of days here with the marriage conference. I thank you for the work that Dwayne and Sherry are doing here in Garland. I thank you for the heritage of this church. We've been here. This is now our third time where we've been privileged to share. But today I'm asking Jesus that you do something a little different, a little unique. I'm asking that you reach out and convince everyone here how crazy about them you are. My prayer, Lord, is that we'll fall more in love with you than we've ever been. But in order for that to happen, we have to receive your love for us. So have your way. Take away any ideas to the contrary. Lord, you look at us and you think we're perfect. We're beautiful. There's no flaw in any of us. May we take our hearts and our minds off of the lies that we've believed in this world and today believe only the truth that we are the pearls of great price. The most beautiful, the most perfect thing you've ever created. <coughs> Penetrate our defense mechanisms, Jesus, and have your way. We ask this for your glory. We ask this in the most beautiful name above all other names. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining me in that prayer. I have a process on Sunday mornings. Uh, it's not unlike, I'm sure, what other Bible teachers do all the time. Uh, I get up, I've, all, I've prepared the Bible studies, of course, that we're going to do. Uh, we have three services at Calvary Chapel of San Antonio, and the, the one thing that, that I want to do is I want to rightly represent the Lord. So having prepared the study, knowing what the Bible says, knowing what it means, my whole purpose on Sunday mornings is to take a walk with Jesus and ask him, what do you want to do with this Bible study? Well, a few years ago, I was out on a Sunday morning. It's always before the sun comes up. Uh, and, and there was something unusual. There was a car that was parked in an alley that I walked down, and it had a for sale sign on it. And I'm an old car guy. And when I looked at that car, I recognized it was a 1986 Toyota Celica. Some of you don't even remember that there was ever such a thing. And this car had a for sale sign on it. The car was a little bit trashed. And on the for sale sign, it had a phone number, of course, and it had the amount that it was for sale. And the amount was $3,000. Again, because I'm an old car guy, all I could think of was, nobody's ever going to pay $3,000 for that. That car is not worth $3,000. It's old and it's kind of junky. And I want to get right back in conversation with Jesus. And so I started thinking again, and the Lord stopped me in my tracks. And he said, how do you know what the value of that car is? And my thought was, well, I know the value of the car because I know the value of cars. It's old. It probably has a billion miles on it. It's not in the best of shape. And my idea was, again, Lord, it's just too much money, 3000 for that car. And he said, the value of something is not established by the seller. 
the value of anything is established by the buyer. Now, what we're going to hear today, and I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles right to the middle to the Song of Songs. What we're going to discover this morning is that your value has been established in heaven. Your value has been established by the one who emptied the vault of heaven to purchase you. And that means you're special. Now, this isn't a self-esteem message. This is a message that says, I want you, the Lord wants you today to view you, your life from his perspective. You're a treasure. The pearl of great price, you're the treasure hidden in the field. But Jesus, the psalmist says, thinks about you all day, every day. And his thoughts, how vast those numbers of thoughts are, those thoughts are precious toward you. If you've ever been in that first love, you remember the, he loves me, he loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. Well, Jesus is in heaven and he's simply saying, I love them, I love them, I love them. We sing how beautiful you are songs to Jesus all the time. Well, heaven sings those same songs to you, about you, all day, every day. This morning is one of those songs. Now, literally... The title of this is Song of Songs. Some translations call it the Song of Solomon. But it's important that this is the song of all the songs because it means that of the 1,005 songs, we know that from 1 Kings chapter 4, of that 1,005 songs written by Solomon, this song was preserved by God because this was the only one of those songs that was written by God. That's a really important thing to understand. This is the song that was preserved. Now, you know some things about Solomon. We know that he was the wisest man, the smartest man who's ever lived. God gave him wisdom and intellect from heaven beyond anything that we can understand. His fame was spread all over the world. But he was also a poet and a songwriter. We know from scriptures that he was Drop dead handsome. I hate him already. (laughs) Rich, smart, handsome, a poet, and he could write songs. I mean, he had it all going on, but this is the song that was the highlight of his life. It was written at a time where he was in love with God. We're also going to see that he was in love with the woman who is the object of this book. It's a story that all of you should be intimately familiar with. It is a story that you ought to read several times a year. If you read it straight through, it will take you no more than 14 or 15 minutes. If you read the parts, if you look in your Bible, there's captions, headlines, lover, beloved, and then there's friends. Well, if you read the parts that are titled lover, That's Jesus speaking to you. You talk about great devotion time. Just just read those. If you read only the parts titled Lover, it'll take you about eight minutes to read it. And it's eight minutes of trying to understand the height and width and breadth and depth of God's love. It is so important, and that's why we ought to be familiar with it. It is a love story. It's a love story about marriage. It's also a story about sex in marriage. When the Lord led me to share this, of course, I thought he was leading me to share it with the marriage conference that we just did the last couple of days. But he said, no, this is the message for Sunday. He wants you to know how much he loves you. It is in poetic language, very graphic and very detailed. Obviously, I'm not going to be graphic today but I will be making some references to the sexual relationship between a man and his wife. Let me say, just at the beginning, that sex is a wonderful gift from God to all of us. It is to be used only in the confines of marriage. And I hope and pray that one of the things we'll accomplish today is it will sort of wipe away 
what the world that we live in has done to the concept of sex. It is a beautiful, magnificent gift. It is certainly more than just reproducing in terms of its value. Now what we're going to do today is we're going to start sort of at the back and then we're going to come to chapter 1 and then move forward to make it easy for you to follow. Would you look at chapter 8, verse 11? Because we're going to talk about the background historically and the background for this book. Remember, as I'm teaching today, this is a real historical story about two people who really lived. King Solomon and the one woman, and that's important later, the one woman who had his heart. He started out, Solomon did, passionate for God. Duane said he's teaching in Ecclesiastes. We know when you get to the book of Ecclesiastes, it's an old Solomon looking back on his life and thinking about all of the time that he wasted. Vanity, vanity, it's all meaningless. That's the point. He came to the conclusion, after denying himself no pleasure at all, he came to the conclusion that anything that wasn't done for God and with God had no meaning, no purpose. And Solomon's life is a story about potential squandered. God's glory poured out and man sort of walking away from it trying to find other avenues for what we would term happiness. And Solomon, because of his wealth, he literally could deny himself nothing. And yet it meant nothing at all. This story was written by a different Solomon, a young man, a king blessed by God, a king who was with God, this was written during that time. The background from verse 11 in chapter 8 says, Solomon had a vineyard in Baal Hamon. He let out, he rented out his vineyard to tenants. Each was to bring for its fruit a thousand shekels of silver. Now, Solomon owned all of the land. This was a government program. The way the government collected taxes, they would rent it out for a thousand shekels, these parcels of land, and then the people would pay the rent with the fruit that was produced, whether it was animals or, or grapes or other types of crops. In this case, the rent was 1,000 shekels. Now, as we begin, I want you to go now back to chapter 1. As we begin our story, it's evidently true that Solomon had those times where he just wanted to get away. You know, a king uh, who's busy running the affairs of state, king who's trying to keep peace and govern through this really prosperous time. But there were times when it seemed to sort of close in around him, and what he wanted to do was just get away. I want to be with the people. There's no better way to get the pulse of the people than to become one of them. Remember that, because that's the import behind this whole story. And so Solomon would go out in disguise. And he would mingle among the people. He would go out by himself. Imagine the president of the United States or another great world leader putting a hat and a fake beard on. You walk into McDonald's and say, you know, he looks familiar. Well, that was what Solomon would do. It's just because he wanted to get away. And one of his trips, he saw a sight that took his breath away in an instant. Chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. Now, I believe that these two verses, or three verses, 9, 10, and 11, were Solomon sort of speaking to himself, muttering under his breath. He looks at this girl, and he says, Wow, I liken you, my darling, to a mare harnessed to one of the chariots of Pharaoh. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings. Your neck with strings of jewels will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. In verse 11, that's a great statement of faith. This is a girl I'm going to have. Now, I know how Solomon feels. In March 20th, 20th, it will have been 49 years since I walked into a gym 
where my old high school was playing basketball against her high school. I saw Paula from across the gym, and she was a cheerleader, and she was jumping and bouncing, and I looked at her from across the gym, and my breath was taken away. I looked at her, and I thought, who is that? She is beautiful. I've got to get her phone number, and I'll save you the details, but I got her phone number. I said March 20th, that was March 13th. March 20th, the following Friday, is when I called her and said, I got your phone number from a mutual friend. He told you I was going to call. Yeah, I, I, I know that. Well, I'm coming into town. So I'd like to go out. How about we have a date? Paula said, well, I already have a date tonight. And I was so desperate. I said the first thing that popped to, to mind and heart. I said, well, I'll, I'll call back in 30 minutes. Break it. I did, and she did. Two hours later, I'm knocking on her door. She opens a door, and in seconds, we were in love. People say stuff like that doesn't happen. We've been together 49 years. God had a plan. Well, Solomon sees this girl. He's in disguise. Nobody knows who he is, and she takes his breath away. Go back a couple of verses to verse 5. This is the beloved. This is the girl. Dark am I, yet lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I'm dark. You can tell that she's uncomfortable with the attention. Do not stare at me because I'm dark, because I'm darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards. My own vineyard, my own body, I have neglected, she says. Now immediately a lot of us can identify with this woman. She was from a dysfunctional family. Her, her brothers were jerks. They were bullies. I don't know, maybe they took advantage of her just because they could. It's amazing to me that men can do that just because they can, but that happens, we know. She worked the vineyard. They didn't. This woman is a woman who's not been cared for in the world that she lived in. It's also true that she had some appearance issues. Truth is, she didn't think she was beautiful at all because the standards for beauty in that day were completely different than, than anything we would understand. Privileged women and princesses, they would spend hours every day taking beauty treatments, and some of those beauty treatments included bleaching of the skin. The whiter the skin, the prettier they were. Remember, this is a Middle Eastern country. They wanted to look what we would call European. Not only were the whiter girls considered the beautiful girls, another standard of beauty was the plumper girls. That would be a sign that they're able to bear children and men would walk by these women and lust after them. And this girl says, but I don't look like any of them. They look beautiful, but, but I'm not like that because I don't get to go to the beauty shop. I don't have time to take care of myself the way others take care of themselves because I simply have to work. This young girl was lean from working outside. There would be a musculature that would be obvious. Her skin was dark, not because she was black, but because she was darkened by the sun. What we consider in our culture beautiful, lean, fit, and tan. The kind of a girl that we would see on magazine covers. But suddenly this stranger is staring at her. And she alone has his attention. And look what he says to her in verse 15 of chapter 1. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Now, there's going to be some cultural references to beauty that they understood that, that will kind of go over our heads. But I want you to just notice he's staring at her. His heart is smitten. And he says, you're beautiful. You're perfect. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Now, ladies, notice what happens next. Because he's convincing her that she's not plain, 
that she's not ordinary. She gets into the act herself. In verse 16, it's her talking. She says, how handsome you are, my lover. Now remember, this is a poem. This isn't in chronological order. So it's not like they just jumped into a tent together. She says, how handsome you are, my lover. Oh, how charming. And please note this next line, and our bed is verdant. One of the great words in the English language, it's hardly ever used anymore. This word verdant, it means ripe and fruitful, green is literally what it means. And this is such a great picture for us to remember. Now, she has appearance issues. She doesn't think she's pretty. Perhaps this is the first time a man has ever looked at her and said, you know what, you're beautiful. You're the most beautiful thing ever. Well, I think for the marriage conference, this would have been a great illustration, but it's true for all of us. Men, this is our responsibility to make our wives feel like the most beautiful, the most loved, the most precious women on the earth. It's our responsibility to rightly represent Jesus. And Solomon, she doesn't know he's Solomon, but Solomon is doing that for her. And because he loves her, she is now beginning to warm up to him. And she's fallen for him. This is probably the first time in her life a man ever looked at her and truly made her feel of value. I want you to leave here today knowing your value to God. You know, we look in a mirror and we're not all that, so what we do is we immediately start tearing ourselves apart. We feel bad about something. Does this make me look thin enough? Does this make me look whatever it is that your issue might be? Jesus is looking at you and saying, no, 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 you're, you're perfect for me. How beautiful you are, my darling. Now, for some of the men, this is hard to hear. But remember, we're all the beloved in this story. And if you can't have Jesus look at you and say, you are beautiful, you're just the way I made you, if we can't do that, we need to get over ourselves. He's smitten with her. Now she is taken by him. I think you're pretty hot. That's going to be your response. Look at the next verse. Before we do that, chapter 2, verse 1. This is a wonderful word picture for us. She says, I'm a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Now, that sounds very poetic, she says, you know, you can just be beautiful, but that's not what she's saying at all. What she's saying is, I'm a common weed. It's the other girls who are beautiful. And in the garden of beautiful girls, I'm just a weed to be picked out and thrown away. Now, one of the things that we know is that women simply don't know how to receive compliments. I look at Paul and tell her all the time, she is so beautiful. After all these years, I still look at her and think, God, I can't believe you let me have her. And I look at her, and, and you know, she does that woman thing. Oh, I'm not that. <laughs> Ladies, learn to take a compliment. Here's the response. When somebody compliments you, just say thank you. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not beautiful. I'm just a common weed. I'm ordinary. In a world of extraordinary, we live in a world where magazine covers are littered with women that the world considers beautiful and they set a standard of beauty that we can't possibly keep up with. And all the while, Jesus is whispering in your ear, you are perfect for me. Listen to how he responds in chapter 2, verse 2. Like a lily among thorns is my darling among the maidens. What he's saying is, no, you're not a common flower. You're my girl. You are beautiful. And now she is beginning to believe it. And she gets back into it in verse 3 through 6. She says, like an apple among the trees of the forest is my lover among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. This is a description of the marriage bed and the sexual activity between them. He's taken me to the banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. Strengthen me with raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I'm faint with love. Verse 6. 
is me. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Now, I want you to think about this from two perspectives, an earthly perspective. Men, this is the safety that our wives are supposed to feel with us. But this is the safety, the security that we're all supposed to feel with Jesus. He wants us to be secure in his love. And this picture in verse 6 is so important because this is an embrace in the act of making love. Looks forward to the moment that the marriage is consummated. Not only is this woman physically excited about her man, she is emotionally safe. Man, if you want your wives to give themselves to you, she has to know she's safe emotionally with you. This picture, an arm here and an arm here, and Jesus holding you. Well, the same thing is true in our walk with the Lord. What we've got to do every day is know that we're safe and secure. I get so frustrated when Christians are talking about and I get a program. I, uh, Dwayne told you I have a Bible question and answer program every day, an hour uh, in San Antonio. And, and all them people, I, I think I'm going to lose my salvation. Others will just say, well, can you lose your salvation or are we eternally secure? How can we not be secure if we're in his arms and if he's holding us close? If he's looking into your eyes, I told the people at the marriage conference, the key to living in the love of God is to just be with Jesus. If you're with him and he's looking at you and he's convincing you how beautiful you are, how perfect you are, then you know you're in a safe place. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 14 says that, that upon believing the Spirit of God is given to us as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Now if I had guaranteed something the guarantee is only as good as my ability to keep it but this is God guaranteeing our inheritance. He wants you to know He loves you. He wants you to be safe and secure in His love. Jesus said if you abide in me I will abide in you. And there's no man or woman abiding in Jesus who feels unsafe. Again, for men, this is the way our wives need to be made to feel. Does your wife trust you? Does she know that your heart is just for her and her alone? Well, if she's going to feel emotionally safe, she needs to. If you want your wife to give herself to you physically. You need to make her feel safe emotionally. He wants us to be secure in that passionate love for us. He wants us to make our wives feel the same way. Now here's where the story kind of turns and instead of just a marriage, this is about you and me as well. Chapter 3, verse 6. Solomon has to go back and do king business. But the whole time he's back in the palace, all he can do is think about this one girl. I imagine the dreams he had about her. Thinking, well, she's the one that I want to marry. I'm going to go get her. At the first opportunity I can, I'm going to go get her. Now remember, he came the first time, a king in disguise. But in verse 6 of chapter 3, he's coming as the king of kings. People are talking. Who is this coming up from the desert like a column of smoke perfumed with myrrh and incense made from all of the spices of the merchant? They answer the question. Look, it's Solomon's carriage escorted by 60 warriors, the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of the night. Now imagine what this was like. They would see the plume of smoke coming from Solomon and his chariots and all of his entourage with him. The people in this particular area where this vineyard was located, the whole community would see him coming from miles and miles away. And of course they'd be nervous. What's going on? Are we under attack? Then they would say, no, it's friendly, but, but, but who is this? And somebody would say, well, look, it's Solomon. It's the king. Now this time when he comes into town, everybody knows who it is. The first time he snuck in and he snuck out, when he came the first time he didn't look like a king at all. That was the whole point. He wanted to be one of the people to get the pulse of the people. I hope you're beginning to understand the picture. Our Jesus is coming back. 
the first time he came, he humbled himself. He didn't look at all like we expect the king to look. We're not far removed from celebrating Christmas, the mystery of mystery, the wonder of wonders, God becoming a baby. Can you imagine for a moment Almighty God being worshipped by angels in heaven only to find himself passing through the birth canal of a teenage girl? Being born not in a palace, but in a stable, laid in a feeding trough, and his first audience is a bunch of shepherds, society's outcasts. Nobody would have imagined he could be the king then. Well, the same thing is true for Solomon. Now, as it was true that Solomon returned, looking every bit the king, it's also true that when Jesus comes the next time, we know what he's going to look like from the book of Revelation. We know he's going to be wearing a robe, and on his robe it's going to say, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he's going to come and every knee will bow and every tongue confess. There won't be any mistaking who this king is when he comes. Well, that's what's happening with Solomon. In chapter 3, verse 11, we get the experience. This is the, 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 the Shulamite. This is with her friends seeing Solomon. And she says, Come out, you daughters of Zion. She's bragging a little bit to her friends. And look at Solomon wearing the crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him on his day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced. Now, what you think about this girl with self-esteem issues? And now Solomon, this, this chariot, his whole entourage, has stopped right in front of her house. And the king, everybody knows who it is. He gets down on one knee. And he asks for her hand in marriage. And all of her friends are around, perhaps the ones who, well, maybe made her feel a little less than beautiful at times. And she's saying, now look, 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 it's Solomon, and he's come for me. I love this picture. Can you imagine the look on her face? The king of kings, the most powerful man in the world. And he's smitten by her. He takes her hand in marriage, and everybody is watching Chapter 4, verse 1, here's what he says, and this is with an audience. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Can you see the pattern developing here? He's won her, now he has her hand. He's not done, men, telling her how beautiful she is. He's going to convince her every day she's alive how beautiful you are. Now before going on and reading this, I want you to understand this is what heaven is doing for you. You may have messed up so badly this past week. You may have lost your temper. You may have said some horrible, horrible things. You may have failed in ways that you never thought you would fail. And you're thinking God is frustrated with you. God is angry with you. Instead, what he's saying is, no, no, no. You're beautiful. I think about you every day. And not only do I think about you, but I watch you. From heaven's perspective, you're beautiful. We did a uh, women's retreat in the recent past and the uh, theme was flawless. And the Spirit of God really convinced our ladies that they were beautiful. The Spirit of God convinced them that his arm was around their neck and around their back and he was holding them. And that's what God wants to convince each and every one of you. He describes your beauty. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from Mount Gilead. Now, we wouldn't consider that much of a compliment, but imagine looking at the hills and you see this flock of goats descending, the the black wool, and from a distance it would just look like hair cascading over a woman's shoulders. She would be uncomfortable because now he's with this audience, he's checking her out. He's going to check her out from head to toe and back up toe to head. He says to her, your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn, coming up from the washing. Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. Now we have to remember, this was a time when there was no dental hygiene. It would be unusual for people to have all of their teeth. And he's describing her, you thought you weren't beautiful. Look at the other girl's teeth. Not like yours at all. You're perfect. Your lips are like scarlet ribbon. 
Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David built with elegance on it. Hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. I told you, man, he was a poet. Your two breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee. I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. And then he concludes, again, all beautiful you are, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Paula, do you ever get tired of hearing me say how beautiful you are? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, but see that's what we have to understand from this I want you to understand that you should never tire of hearing God tell you how precious you are how beautiful you are to him man if you're too tough for this kind of stuff get over yourself I love the fact that God loves me you know I worry as I get older I'm a hundred years old now and I just keep thinking you know my, God, my pants don't fit my, this is tight I'm uncomfortable this hurts and that hurts and Jesus constantly says no you're perfect you're perfect not only am I perfect to him I'm perfect for her in eternity past God put two kids who weren't even saved together We trampled all over his grace. We did everything the wrong way. I didn't get saved until 21 years after we were married. She got saved 13 years before me. Paul had all kinds of issues in her home growing up. She had issues with a husband who was a jerk, who worked 100 plus hour weeks, no exaggeration. My God was money. I wanted everybody to know how successful I was. If she complained about me not being there for her or the kids not spending time, I would lie to myself, lie to her and say, well, you know I'm doing this for you. I just want to provide security. And I was very successful. Problem is, my marriage was a failure. My wife didn't feel beautiful. My wife didn't know she was loved. Paula asked me every single day, no exaggeration, every day, do you love me? And I would get frustrated. Yes, I love you. I married you. I loved you then. I tell you, I love you every day when you ask. I'll tell you again tomorrow when you ask. But she had to ask because she didn't benefit from my love. Are you benefiting from the love of God? Do you take time daily to let him just pour out his love on you and and hopefully through you to others? Is your life a life that demonstrates the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Is that what other people see? Are your children able to look at their dad and say, this is a man who loves Jesus with all of his heart and that love of Jesus pours through him to me and I know I'm loved. Does your wife, men, feel that way? Ladies, are you a woman that people see Jesus coming through? Well, it's impossible until and unless you understand that God loves you. We love him, the Bible says. Why? Because he first loved us. And every day, you've got to remember how much he loves you. Every day has got to be that moment when you say, okay, I don't feel good today, but Jesus still loves me. You might be thinking, well, I'm not perfect. I mess up all the time. Well, the only way you're going to stop me messing up is to believe he loves you and that you're perfect. Set your bar a little bit higher. Look into his eyes every day. Take time and let him convince you, oh, beautiful you are, my darling. There is no flaw in you. Men, husbands, I want you to notice, ladies, this will work for you as well. But there's no criticism of her here. He doesn't say, oh, beautiful you are, my darling. But you know what? I wish you'd like lose a few pounds. Maybe you could go take some of those whitening bleach treatments that the other girls take so so you look more beautiful according to the world standards. There's no 
criticism at all. The first 21 years we were together, I criticized everything that she did. I'm so ashamed of the way I live my life. But when I met Jesus, and I met Jesus because she prayed for me for 13 years, when I met Jesus, I went home, I mean, radically transformed. And the woman that I complained about all the time, I walked in the house, and it was like that very first day she opened the door all those years ago. I always prayed, you know, when you're not saved, we still pray. God, why don't you give me a woman that will appreciate me? Why won't you give me a woman who will understand why I'm doing what I'm doing? That's code for, why don't you give me a woman who will let me do whatever I want? The day I got saved, I went home. That woman lived in my house. Our job is to make our wives feel that beautiful, that special that perfect and then we grow some of you are raising children many of you perhaps we're critical of them we yell at them we insult them we're harsh toward them they're going to live down to those expectations if you'll take time to convince them that God loves them and they're perfect and and if they'll be able to see that God loves them because of the way you treat them They'll be able to see your love. Men, we need to be tender with our children. Our boys are learning how to be men watching your lives. What are your children learning? Your girls, God forbid, they're learning how a real man treats a woman and they're going to go out and pick somebody just like dad. If that's true, and it is, then you need to be sure that they pick somebody who loves Jesus. All beautiful you are, my darling. There's no flaw in you. Go down to chapter 4, verse 10. Because now he describes the physical relationship. How delightful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much more pleasing is your love than wine and the fragrance of your perfume than any spice. Your lips drop sweetness as the honeycomb. My bride, milk and honey are under your tongue. The fragrance of your garments is like that of Lebanon. Go down to verse 15. You are a garden fountain, a well flowing, uh, I'm sorry, a a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon, awake north wind and come some uh, come south wind, blow on my garden, that is its fragrance may spread abroad. Let my lover come into his garden and taste his choice of fruits. That's her getting in the physical relationship. God wants your physical relationship, men and women who are married, to be passionate. You know, sex isn't just some marital duty that we have. It's not something that we should grow tired of. You who aren't married, you need to look forward to a relationship that God has ordained with your bodies. In chapter 5, verse 1, he says, I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. In other words, I am completely satisfied. The physical relationship, which isn't the point of our message today, is a picture, an outward picture of this work that God does in your heart when you are convinced of his love. Go down to verse 10, or back to verse 10, rather, in chapter 5. This is how she speaks of her husband, ladies. My lover is radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. His head is pure as gold. His hair is wavy and black as a raven. His eyes are like doves by the water streams, washed in milk, mounted like jewels. His cheeks are like beds of spice, yielding perfume. His lips are like lilies, dripping with muir. His arms, I always read this only because this is what I imagine Paula thinks of me. His arms are rods of gold set with chrysolite. His body is like polished ivory. 
decorated with sapphires. His legs are pillars of marble set on bases of pure gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choices at cedars. His mouth is sweetness itself. He's all together lovely. I think she really thinks that about me. But you see, that's what happens when two people in a marriage love Jesus. That's the love of God pouring from us to one another. That's not me. There's no point of criticizing. There's no point of wishing that he or she looked different or, or was different. It's, 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 this is my gift, Lord. This is my lover. This, my friend, O oh daughters of Jerusalem. That's the love story. I'm going to close with a couple of comments. Back in chapter 8, verse 10, she says this. He has so convinced her of all the things that we've talked about today. She says, I am a wall. Remember the one who says, I'm a common weed? Now she says, I'm a wall. Walls were very important in the ancient world. They were places to, to secure yourself. They were fortified cities. And that's what she's saying. Look, I'm a fortified city. I'm a wall. My breasts are like towers. I didn't think I was pretty before, but you know what? He's right. I'm convinced. Thus I have become in his eyes like one bringing contentment. Jesus wants all of this, not only for your marriage, but he wants this kind of understanding in your relationship with God. You know, one of the problems that we have, Pastor Dwayne does marriage counseling. We do a lot of marriage counseling at our church. Uh, but, but, but it's not just in the confines of marriage. The counseling that we do, almost all of it is a result of people not understanding their value to God. It's why women give their bodies away to men who won't marry them. It's sort of the way that they can understand that somebody's loving them, at least in a physical sense. They understand that's the value. It's something they can control. It's something they have to give. But when that happens, it's only because they don't know their value to God. Paul and I are old enough now that she can talk like this, but she'll look at people and, and you can see the look of hurt in people's faces and she will often go up to somebody and put their face in her hands and she'll say, oh baby, if only you knew how much God loved you, if you only knew your value to him, you would never again settle for less than God's best for you. This woman in our story who started out with issues she now finally and completely believes her value. And until we understand our value to God, until it's a part of our daily life, and when I say daily, I mean hour by hour, even minute by minute. If we understand our value to Him, it'll change who we are. In verse 14 of chapter 8, this is, Come away, my lover. And be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the spice-laden mountains. You see, that's the happy ending. But there's no happy ending. If you leave here today and you still think God's angry with you because you messed up. If you look at the Lord and you think, well, you haven't done this for me, you haven't done that for me. You don't understand your value to him. His work in your life isn't about the things in your life. It's not about the circumstances. It's about you. And if you'll let him today come to you and convince you how precious you are, how beautiful you are, maybe you can even sort of blush a little bit. If you'll do that, you'll leave here today thinking, you know what? Jesus is crazy about me. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. I want you, it doesn't matter what you think. God wants to change your lives today. And the only way that can happen is if you accept the fullness of his love, the extravagance of his love. If you'll do that, the world's going to see a completely different you. You want to be unique? You hang out with Jesus. 
and let him convince you of how special you are. Not special in a sense of a participation trophy, (laughs) but special in the sense that there's no one like you ever before or ever again. Special in the sense that God has a plan for your life that he mapped out. Ephesians 2.10, believe it or not, says that we're God's poem, his expression of beauty. In other words, you're the most beautiful thing he ever did. And then it says that he's prepared you in advance for the works that he's prepared for you to do. In other words, God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. But you've got to believe it. And if you go home and the rest of today is like every other Sunday, if you go home and don't change, if you go home still thinking poorly of yourself or even worse, poorly of others, it's because, baby, you don't know how much God loves you. We need nothing. We need no one but Jesus. And if you'll spend time with him and you'll really and truly let him convince you of his love, I promise you a rich, passionate, meaningful, purposeful life in Christ. But you've got to let him start with you today. And then what anybody does, what anybody says, will have almost zero effect. Because you can leave here with Jesus, with his arm around your neck, his other arm around your waist, him looking into your eyes and saying, you really are perfect for me. And that's all he wants.